Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 31st meeting of 2018. There are no apologies, but Liam Kerr has indicated he'll arrive um, slightly late for the meeting. Uh, agenda item one is our second evidence session on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. I welcome our first panel, Jaljeet Deg Degan, um, National Programme Manager for Child Sexual Exploitation, Bernardo Scotland, Mary Glasgow, Chief Executive of Children First, and Malcolm Schaefer, Head of Practice and Policy, Scotland's Children's Reporter Administration. Can I thank you all for your written evidence? As always, then, the committee find that particularly valuable um, in advance of our formal evidence session. Um, we now have uh, questions questions from members, starting with Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, and I note from your submissions that you're all largely supportive of the measures, but I wonder if you could um, maybe tell us of any concerns that you might have, um, including special measures, um, anything that, that you'd like to flag up about the, the proposal. Who'd like to start? Right, Mr. Okay, I'll perhaps start, um, and perhaps start by saying yes, we do welcome. This is a progressive way forward, and nothing I say should contradict that. Um, and I do understand the need to do it incrementally, to test it out in terms of resources. I guess I would like to um, speak briefly about our end, the children's hearing end, and its relationship to these proposals. And a slight worry I always have that we make law by silos that your concentration is upon criminal justice and about the prosecution, and that's what this bill is about. Um, but the law intervenes in different ways in these cases. So um, if you have, for instance, a child who is alleged to have been raped by her father, then the law will intervene to prosecute the father, and these proposals are very much aimed about securing the best quality and the best experience for that child if she has to give evidence. But quite separately, the law also applies to protect the child, which is where we come in, the children's hearing system. And um, where I'm left slightly confused about is where do we stand in relation to the issues of recording being applied to the hearing system? Um, we will often have to go through the same proof. Quite often, if the child, for instance, is in a place of safety, that proof will have taken place before the prosecution. So there's a very complicated interrelationship between prosecution and protection proceedings um, and an overlap in terms of the evidence that is heard. We do have, because we are civil proceedings, the ability to admit hearsay evidence, which can mean that the child's direct evidence is not always required, but on occasions it is. So I am left slightly confused, and I think there's more work to be done just ensuring that um, there is um, seamless between the two parts um, the hearing system also obviously applies in relation to children who offend. And there will be some occasions upon which a child who commits a rape may be referred to us to deal with. Now, these provisions are very much in relation to high court prosecution proceedings. They don't apply to the children's hearing proof. So there's a few gaps there. We have been involved in, some, in the discussions on the evidence and procedural um, mm -hmm. review. We've very much supported, as I say, on the way forward. But I think we do need to look at the mistakes sometimes that have been made in the past of creating laws in one silo which don't apply across to the other silo, which is equally important in terms of the protection mm -hmm. of the child. And that above all, is, is my main issue in relation to these provisions. Can I ask on, on your first point, do you have a sort of solution to that or, or a preferred 
way that we should be going. Um, the preferred way would be rather than creating laws in criminal justice and laws in family law, mm -hmm. which is what's happening at the moment, that there's a joined upness mm -hmm. which concentrates on the child rather than the system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and doesn't create any confusion or creation. I mean, for instance, in terms of special measures, there's a provision in criminal law to allow the evidence of prior statement to be admitted. Mm. Very valuable, very useful, but not, it hasn't been extended to our proceedings. Mm. Um, you know, so, so there are examples of innovation in criminal justice where somehow it's not directly applied across. And it's because we work in different silos of, of, of law and justice. Um, you know, so there's separate family law consultations, which I hope will bring about many of these issues. Um, but we need to marry it together. We need to ensure that um, children are not caught in the middle, where we require that child's evidence to be heard in our proceedings, mm -hmm. but have to apply separate measures, mm -hmm. which may not offer the same protection. Ironically, that's available in criminal justice. And, and that, above all, is the main core issue that we have with this. Um, and as I say, it applies to law reform in general, not just to these provisions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any, any other panel member want to comment? I think, like Malcolm, we welcome the bill. I um, would also concur with the, the comments that he's made, but also we feel there are already measures in place. And one of the big challenges with this bill is um, about how do you ensure that custom practice, culture, behaviours are enforced in the way that we should. So we've already had special measures, but we hear lots of stories whereby um, they're not applied or children are not offered them. And that the whole, the, whilst the bill is welcome, that it really doesn't go as far as it should in order to, to realise children's rights to be able to give their evidence in a way that's commensurate with their developmental stage, that takes account of the way in which they communicate, that understands the impact of trauma. So there's much more that could and should be done and a much quicker pace for children. So we often hear of situations where children are still being told that they'll get better justice if they give evidence without special measures. There still continues to be a lack of support for families, whole families, for parents and for children. As they go through the process, there's long delays continually, and there's often situations where we hear children continuing to tell us that the experience of going to court in itself is more traumatic than the abuse that they have suffered. And then the other thing that we feel um, we really need to think about is the shocking lack of support to prepare families and children for the experience and then to recover in the aftermath, because that's where the gaps are. So although we welcome the bill, we would really like to see a much more, um, a faster approach towards a child's house model where no child goes into court because it's clear that they are not able to give their best evidence in that process. The, the court system that we have is not set up for children to be able to do that. And we think and strongly believe that if we got the system right for children, if it was much more developmentally appropriate, if it took account of the impact of trauma, we would get better justice, not only for children, but also for the accused because of the impact that the process has on a child's ability to be able to explain what's happened to them and give good, good evidence in that context. So are you saying the bill doesn't go far enough or it's 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 too being too phased in at a too slow pace? I think it, pace? It, it's welcome, but it, we would like to see it go much further. We would like to see, based on the, the stories that we hear from children who are victims and witnesses, that special measures are useful way to mitigate against a system that doesn't allow for children to give their best evidence. What would be much more welcome would be um, if Scotland could move towards a much faster system where children are removed from having to go to court at all, that they go to um, you know, specialised suites where the, the trauma recovery starts at the moment of disclosure, where they give their evidence away from the court system and they, they're not expected to engage in a system which they find it difficult to navigate their way through and which causes them harm currently. Thank you. Daljeet? I suppose there's not very much left to say. I mean, I, I suppose similar to both Malcolm and Mary, but, uh, Bernardo's uh, also welcomes the opportunity to, to give evidence today and also welcomes the opportunity to improve measures. But I suppose my starting point would be 
that although although we welcome this, there's actually stages before we even get to this stage that act as barriers for children. So, so many of the children that we work with and from a, um, who ex have experienced child sexual exploitation in particular often, um, because they don't recognise the abuse, won't even disclose it. So therefore, we, we need to have practitioners on the ground who are actually able to identify what the issues are to begin with, so that we can actually safely support children through that process that both Mary and Malcolm have spoke about already. Um, I, I think often what we find is, in, in our experience of child sexual exploitation cases, and I've been involved in a number of police operations over the last seven years, is that that even when the police investigation is concluded and statements have been taken, the actual process then can be years later. Um, we, we recently found ourselves in a situation where we were chapping the doors of, of young women who were now in their 20s, um, who had given statements when they were aged 14 and 15, and, and, and their, their situations moved on, and yet we are going back again to re-traumatise, to say, well, we've got new evidence, are you willing to come forward? But we don't know how long this process is going to take. Mm -hmm. So again, in terms of, you know, that, that lengthy delay in understanding procedures and processes, um, and, and there's also that link between the children's hearing process and the criminal justice process, because young people become adults, and situations change. Um, so I do think it is about just reiterating uh, Mary's point about culture and practice. It's not necessarily about the measures, mm -hmm. but it's also about making sure that, that we've got the right people involved at the right stages who are competent mm -hmm. and also child-centred, um, first and foremost. But it's about, about making sure that we've got that support for children before, during and after um, that whole process. So does that come down to training then? Um, yeah, at all I mean, levels. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think it's significant because it's, it's it's not it's not just about training, but it's about I suppose it's about about people who are involved who actually want to be involved and who want to work with children and understand not just child development and attachment and trauma, but also mm -hmm. brain development and also understand that actually a, a kind of child's ability to kind of um, to kind of remember. Um, in terms of recalling memories can be quite difficult as well. I mean, we had a young person, I was saying earlier to a colleague, um, who gave 27 statements to the police. And by the time it came to um, the court process, she was deemed an unreliable witness. Um, and she should never have given 27 statements. It's about, you know, thinking about at what stage do we take the statement? At what stage is this child now ready? Because the more she was interviewed, the more she remembered, but the more she contradicted herself because there was multiple perpetrators, there was multiple locations, there was multiple episodes. So she couldn't remember the details. So every time she was interviewed, information changed. And when the procurator fiscal looked at it, she said, there's absolutely no way I'm putting her on the stand. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, she, she, she was the main complainant. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I, th I think it's about training at every single level, not just you know, in terms of the actual court processes, but it's way before that in terms of that first person who engages with that child, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how we take them through that process. Mm -hmm. And also, workers on the ground often don't understand what they can and can't talk to children about, you know, because, because they have this fear of contaminating evidence. So often they think, well... I'd, I'd, I'd rather not say anything, and then the child feels even more or, or even less supported, and then doesn't go through those processes. So I think it's it's about that culture that, that we have just now, which doesn't seem to be child friendly in terms of um, taking young people through a process that should hopefully give them better outcomes and help them re recover and move on with the rest of their lives. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, supplementary. We've got Fulton, Lee MacArthur, and then Daniel. Uh, thanks, Convener. It was actually going back to, to Malcolm's point, although the conversation moved on a, a bit, and that was some really powerful evidence here. Would you agree, uh, Malcolm, uh, I, I agree what you're saying about the systems marrying up, but would you agree that children's hearing systems designed um, to be child-friendly, uh, child-focused, and although it's got uh, some areas where, where improvements are needed, I know you've said that before, um, that it's totally different from the court system, where it's not a good place for kids to give evidence, and that's what this... Bill is primarily trying to address? It is, but it, we could still do it better at all stages, and that's something we're working on through our Better Hearings project. But we have to remember that the court does come into the children's hearing system at different stages. If the grounds are denied, it goes to court for proof, as you'll be aware, and that can be a, a very challenging and formal process um, heard before court um, in formal court setting. 
And secondly, there's obviously an appeal against any decision of the hearing, so the court again comes in then. So court rules do come in and apply. Court um, facilities come in, um, the settings, and the whole way in which children are supported in that process, if they're needed, applies in our setting. As I've said earlier, where we do have an advantage is that we can apply, <coughs> excuse me, hearsay evidence. So in many occasions, if we can avoid the child giving evidence at all, we will. Um, but that is not always possible, and in particular will not be possible if the child is the victim of an offence committed by a child. So, so as you're concerned more around um, when a case, in the circumstances that a case proceeds to court and a child's evidence, may be required as opposed to when you would use hearsay evidence or when it stays at the children's hearing system um, in the first instance? Well, it, it's trying to work out what the status is of the evidence that has been collected in the criminal process. You know, if the recording has already taken place, um, how can we use it? Do we have to start again? Do we have to take evidence by commission, which we've done mm -hmm. on occasions? Can we rely on that as the hearsay evidence? I'm not sure we can. Um, it would be regarded as a prior statement. So there are elements of that which, um, you know, as we progress the criminal side, let's make sure that the child protection side pro progresses as well. Let's remember, yes, there is the informality of the children's hearing itself, but let's not forget that there is the court that comes in the elements and that needs you know, the protective measures and progressive measures that are being introduced in criminal law. Thanks. All right. Uh, Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Just following up, Mary, your evidence in relation to the, the current measures that I think you're suggesting aren't necessarily uh, applied um, in all circumstances, uh, as one might expect. I suppose the argument we were getting from the Bill team last week was that this is a staged approach in essence, to ensure that things are bedded in before um, the, the, the schemes extend, extended further, is that is that an approach you think is is sensible? Picking up where it's not currently being uh, applied when it when it should be, as well as the the extensions that are pr proposed through this legislation. It is, but I think there are huge practical challenges around this. So we we have to think about the, the training and the experience and the knowledge and skill of the people that are involved, but we also have to think about where it is that children are going to go to give evidence in terms of a pre-recorded interview. So we, we still know that children will be interviewed in police stations, they're still being interviewed in school, which is totally inappropriate. So it's about, yes, it's useful, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but it just doesn't go far enough in terms of delivering rights-based justice for children. If we really thought about the best possible opportunity for children to give their evidence, they would go nowhere near court. They would go to specialist resources where their whole needs were supported, where their family were given advice about the process, how what would happen from the moment of um, disclosure and interview right the way through to the court process in terms of time scale. We would also offer much more effective um, support to help children and their families talk about what's happened under cover. So although it, does, it is a step in the right direction, there are many practical challenges. There are many ways in which this will... Um, be difficult to implement unless we're really, really clear about what true child-centred rights-based justice looks but, but like. But what you described there wouldn't necessarily say that you'd be extending it to a, a broader range of circumstances, but, but more that the setting, as you've rightly described, needs to be appropriate as well as mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the fact that the, the child is, is being kind of triaged through this and, and is being kept away from a, a court setting. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that would tend to suggest um, the, uh, uh, an incremental introduction of this in the right locations with the right support mm -hmm. is the best way of, of, mm -hmm. of securing the objectives mm -hmm. here. I think the challenge is, though, to make sure that... We, before, you know, yes, you're right, there needs to be, an, there needs to be a careful... Um, 
approach to this so that people can build something that gives all children, no matter what their circumstances, the same level of support. But the, the, the thing that we would really urge the Parliament to do is really keep, or the committee to do, is keep an eye on this, not just in relation to this legislation, but throughout the lifetime of the, the Parliament, because the, the fear is that we do this and we think that's it, job done. And actually, there is a long way to go to deliver justice for children. So we know that the um, children are continually subject to the things that are convenient or possible or um, the, the agencies are able to deliver. And what we really need to do, is, as all the panel members have said, is make sure that what children need is at the centre of what the system is that we build, not just what's possible for us to deliver incrementally. So we do need to really hold on to this notion that children will give their best evidence, which is better for them and better for the justice system in total, if we build a system around them that understands the impact of trauma, understands the way they communicate, gives their whole family the support they need to understand what is an incredibly complex system to navigate. Most professionals find it intimidating to go to court. Um, and for children, even when we put special measures in place, it's often still not built around what the child's needs are. It's built around what's possible for the professionals or the agencies to be able to do well. Okay. Okay. And Daniel. Just as a point of clarification, in part in terms of what you've just said, you said that, that, that in your view, children shouldn't be giving evidence in court and, and be away from that in a, in a, a sort of a, an appropriate setting. I mean, my understanding is that the court service is developing uh, facilities to provide exactly that, so that the evidence can be given in uh, uh, you know, specially designed suites. Now, that that's clearly not on the face of the bill, but it is what, what, what is being developed in practice. I mean, to what extent do you think that needs to be on the face of the bill, or are you saying that that's insufficient? And likewise, some of the things you were mentioning there in terms of interviews and police stations and schools, that's very much at the investigation stage rather than court proceedings. I mean, are you saying that, that, that the bill should be looking at those things as, as well, or are you saying that that sort of next steps. I, I just, I'm just trying to clarify what, what you think should be in the bill to improve these things and, and, and to what extent it's insufficient simply to leave things up to, as a matter of, of practice. Well, we would have welcomed the, if the bill had gone much further and fully um, work towards the implementation of a child's house model, whereby you do take children completely out of the court system. We recognise the challenges in relation to our adversarial justice system and that there are some, there's lots of work that's been picked up that needs to um, happen. But I think the concern for us is that when we talk about the child witness suites that are being developed, there are some real positives around that, but they are far from being the same as a child's house model that you see in other countries. So they are the place where children will go to give their evidence, it will be pre-recorded, but there is, continues to be a huge gap for children and their families, as uh, Daljeet talked about, around navigating their way through the whole process. So they need support. In order for the court system to work for children and for justice, there needs to be a much better rec recognition of children's needs. So long delays, so if, if, if something happens to a child and they're interviewed and then the um, evidence is taken, then and the, the evidence goes into court, that's one thing. But there's still an impact on that child around understanding the timing, what's going to happen, who's going to support them, who's going to feed back to them, how do they access support to recover from what's happened. And the bill, you know, it is a, we do welcome the bill and it is a step in the right direction, but of course as an organisation that works with child victims and witnesses and hear every day the dreadful impact that um, you know situations have on them and then that the court system can often make worse it doesn't go far enough for us we would have wanted to see something that said there is no way that children with all that we know about their development all that we're learning about the way in which children communicate should be um, entering into an, an adversarial system that was developed in the in a vic Victorian era, we would want them out of the court system completely and we think that we need to do that sooner rather than later. We do recognise the challenges around it, 
but, and so we welcome the bill um, and we do think progress has been made, but we don't think we should rest on our, our laurels and think that um, you know, developing child witness suites where it's just a different place for children to go, it's just a different place. It might have a nice, uh, a differently painted room and some nice people there, but actually the whole system needs to be right for children from the point at which they tell their story to the support that they get alongside their families to recover from what will have lifelong impact on them. So it needs to be a much more holistic approach to what the system, how children interact with the system. It's not just about giving evidence, and it's difficult for us to comment and say that it's just about that, but um, if you got that right, it would help. But it's much more holistic than so, that. So I guess my, 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 my difficulty with that is I, I don't understand how you could do that without essentially completely moving away from our adversarial system. Is, is that really fundamentally what you're, you're asking for? We think we could go further within the system that we've got. Of course, we would like to move to a system which is not adversarial because it doesn't work for children. It doesn't respect their rights. They don't recall and give evidence in, in the way that, it, that that suits them. But we recognise the system that we're in. We're supportive of the, the measures to improve things as they are. But there is a need to continue to go further for children. And we do think there are ways in which, within our system, we could have gone further and we can go further. But we recognise there are some challenges around that. You were nodding vigorously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose, from, from my perspective, it's, it, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get the best quality evidence from a child that we possibly can. So w what we shouldn't be doing is making them jump through hoops and it shouldn't be a postcode lottery because that's what it'll be become if we don't embed right from the start um, what we mean by a place for children to go to give their evidence because it's not like going to a sexual health clinic where you get patched up and then you go through the next door and you go and get your medication or your contraception. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Because what we're doing is, is getting young people to go through different doors, speak to different professionals at different stages who can often tell conflicting, contradic give them contradictory information. Um, and often those professionals themselves won't know, you know, what stage they're at during that process. So it's about having a kind of holistic approach, almost like the kind of team around the child, where you've got a team who are working quite closely together, whether it's teams that are based in the court or police stations or social work or, you know, voluntary sector services, but it's about that team around the child who've got different roles to play, but also keep that child and their family and their wider network um, informed each stage of the way in terms of what's actually happening um, and providing that feedback. Because often what we do is take information from a child, it goes into a machine somewhere else, um, and we don't actually let young people know what's happening next. And, 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 and often we actually, as professionals, don't know what's going to happen next. But even if we were to say, I can check with Mary, and Mary will find out, and Mary will come back to me in two days' time. Do you know what I mean? It's keeping young people informed about, and that also keeps them engaged in the process. And less likely to then retract and withdraw um, their evidence as well, which is certainly our experience where young people will say, well, do you know what? This is too difficult. It's too much hassle. I just want to move on with the rest of my life. So I just want to put this to one side. And that's what often happens. Okay. Um, anything else to add? We're quite happy with that. Yeah. John. Good morning, panel. Um, your evidence has, has been extremely interesting. I, I wonder, Mary, if I can comment on, on a bit of information that's in your evidence we haven't touched on directly yet, and it's, it's <coughs> excuse me, the circumstances whereby a, a young person was advised that they were more likely to secure a conviction if they presented their evidence without um, special measures. Now, that was advice from Victim Information and Advice Unit, which in itself is, is a cause for some concern. And you then go on to talk about cultural notions of justice can result in child witnesses expressing a strong preference to give evidence in court within a courtroom setting um, without a fully informed understanding of what this could be like. I mean, that's presumably absolutely key to everything. That, 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 um, you have been asked already, does the panel think that this legislation goes far enough in addressing the culture that still has these foundation stones that, you know, stand up strong and say your bit. That's the challenge with any legislation, isn't it? About It, it helps in terms of, um, you know, obviously it helps to lay, to lay the groundwork around what we should be doing. But what we really need to think about is how do you embed practically 
an approach that recognises that children have an entitlement and a right to have a, to engage with a system in order to achieve justice, which recognises the ways in which they are, are able to recall information, the sense that they make of a very complex adult world, the impact that the trauma will have had on their ability to communicate what's happened to them. And there is a huge gap in that, you know, we 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 know and we know that there is a huge gap. It's hopefully going to be addressed through a number of other processes, but there is a huge gap in professional understanding of the impact of trauma on children. There's a gap in relation to the understanding of professionals around child development, around how children do communicate. The the system doesn't take account of the ways in which children develop and that has a huge impact on their ability to get justice. So, you know, the legislation will help, but we really need to be very clear practically about what resources that will be required in order to be able to make this legislation and the principles in the legislation a reality for children. Oh, sorry, did yeah, you have if, a, if I, a supplementary? If, yes, just, yeah. I, if I may briefly, please, to, to tell you, tell you it, it, I mean, clearly there's been a lot of resources deployed to secure 20-odd statements from someone. What, what you see in the legislation, would you envisage that that would mean that that situation wouldn't happen again? I, mean, I think certainly one of the lessons um, from that operation was that what, what, what was more important was not getting the statement, but, but actually building and developing a relationship with the young person, you know, and, and understanding um, who they were, you know, what their talents and interests were. And, and actually, because often what young people say is that all that police officers are interested in is getting my statement and then going away and, and I never see that person again. Um, and, and I think sometimes, certainly when we've been involved in a number of police operations, things have developed and changed. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like... Um, when we've, when, when we've had young people who've been, who, who have been subject to special measures, um, they have recounted that, that often what that means is maybe going along to the court, seeing what the courtroom looks like, who's going to sit where. And although that's helpful, what happened for that particular young person was at the very last minute, the actual court changed. So they found themselves going to a different court. So actually the benefits had no impact whatsoever. You know, so it's, it is thinking about... What, What's the best way in getting evidence from young people, and, and where should that take place? Do you know whether it's in a court setting or whether it's in a, in, a, in a different place? But it's about, for me, at the end of the day, about making sure that we're meeting the holistic needs of the child and their family and their networks around them, because often as professionals, we we will follow young person through young people through our journey, but often at the end of that journey, we all step aside, and it's about how, how that young person continues to. To, to, I suppose to kind of develop and recover, because um, often the kind of supports step away. So it's looking at you know what what are the supports that we're putting in place, not just before and during the court processes, but afterwards when everyone just steps aside. Thank you. Okay. Jenny, Beena, um, Dari, I note that you you spoke at length there about the best quality evidence and about meeting the holistic needs of children. I just wonder, with regard to the current use of taking evidence by commissioner. Do you believe that delivers the best quality evidence presently? I, I suppose, from uh, I, again, I, I mean, we, we um, had put quite a limited uh, submission um, into in, into uh, yourselves, and it was it was based very much on young people's experiences of before, during, and after. So I think in terms of the measures, um, I, th I think we welcome the measures. I mean, clearly what we would like to see is and understand why they're, they're phased in terms of age and, and court settings. But I think at the very least, what I suppose what we'd be looking for is it, for the possibility of it being increased to children under the age of 18. Because mm -hmm. um, I think um, often what we have is we've had young people, for instance, where um, there's been, you know, a kind of, um, a kind of offence get committed against them aged 14, but by the time they've presented at court, they're 16 and a half, mm -hmm. and they're, they're a very different person from that 14-year-old. <laughs> and because of the trauma, um, they're now potentially involved in lots of behaviours that are not seen to be positive. Um, so, so, so what the court sees is quite a difficult, belligerent, drug addicted, alcoholic young person rather than the child that was in front of them um, in terms of when these offences happened. So I think it's about you know making sure that 
we're actually presenting what happened to the child as opposed to you know how that child's coming across um, mm -hmm. now because it does take such a, a lengthy time in terms of um, the court process. Mm -hmm. And do you think perhaps then in terms of that time delay, I know you've alluded to that already this morning, um, that could be expedited then perhaps for, for children? Well, Is that what you would be well, advocating for? So, at the very least, yeah, yeah. but I, I understand that that will be a challenge. But it's looking at, you know, what, what, what I, I mean, I, I, I don't have the, the kind of technical knowledge in terms of all the different processes, do you know what I mean? From that minute, the young person discloses right away in, in terms of recovery. But I suppose it's about sitting down looking at, well, what, what are all those markers and, mm -hmm. and, and not applying adult processes and looking at what's in the best interest of the child and what can we do now to expedite some mm -hmm. of those processes? Thank you. The rest of the panel? I Con concur with that. I, mean, I think we, we are hearing continually, and I think this is a, a danger in, in the bill, actually, that when children talk about what's happened to them, they're, currently we still hear, particularly in Sheriff Court, actually, where there are still long delays. The child gives a statement to the police. We, you know, we've, we've, we've got children who do that alone. So nine-year-olds who go to police stations give their evidence alone, and then nine months later, a letter pops through the door to cite them as uh, to, to go to court. That child has, you know, coped in whatever way they can, usually not well with what happened to them, and then out the blue, without any support to really think about that, and in the, in the intervening period, are expected to go to court. So we need to be really careful that you're right. The system, we don't think that job done just because children are then able to give their evidence in a pre-recorded way and the evidence goes to court because the process needs to be shorter. That, mm -hmm. that stays with that child. Yeah. It doesn't disappear once you've given your evidence that's recorded and you don't need to go to court. That's better than having to go to court. But that child is still living with the knowledge that at some point that story, that evidence will be presented. So if we can shorten that process as quickly as possible, we have a much better chance of encouraging and helping children to recover. And the truth is there is a huge lack of resources there is a huge lack of human resources. Children want a person, a relationship with a person who can walk through this process with them, who can support them from the moment they talk about what's happened right the way through to the process being concluded and support particularly parents to, to talk about what's happened. The danger is, as Daljeet just eloquently described, children bury this stuff and then it always emerges when they're older. It emerges in behaviours that are viewed as not helpful and then they're often punished for those behaviours and no one tracks it back to the moment at which this child was a victim of a serious crime. And we really need to hold our understanding of what it is that trauma does to children and that we should not have a system that through its protracted nature, which is set up to suit all the agencies that are involved, further damages children. Thank you. Um, I know, Mary Glasgow, in your uh, evidence earlier on, you spoke about that lack of support for families, and that, I suppose, ties in in terms of providing that emotional resilience to young people. Um, and Dalji, in your written submission, you also allude to this, and you talk about a gap in terms of support um, for parents and carers. And you then go on to talk about perhaps suggesting um, advocacy. Um, is, is that what you think support should look like? Because, obviously, some young people don't have parents or carers at home to look after them, so perhaps might there be a role then for the school to be involved in that support? Who would you acknowledge, or who would you like to see provide and better support um, to young people through this process? I mean, I suppose that that's why in, in some of the answers I've, I've given, I've, I've, I've referred to children, their parents and carers and their wider networks yeah. around them. I, I don't think we can say it should be the school, it should be the youth worker. I think it's about, you know, getting alongside that child and actually working out with them who's best placed to support them and who they actually want to support them. Because mm -hmm. often what you find is that the, the, the very agencies that have the closest relationships um, with children and young people are often excluded from some of these processes mm -hmm. um, because they're not statutory or they're not experienced in that particular area of work. But that wouldn't be the choice of the child. You know what I mean? And I think Mary's absolutely right because from our experience, what young... I mean, I used to work in a service where th th there was this idea that you would, you would undertake street work and you'd meet the young person, you'd then pass them on to a duty service who would then pass them on to, to, to the resource resettlement service. The young people I met in the street wanted me to continue that journey with them through the process. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
but, but resources capacity didn't always allow that to happen. And I think we have this notion in our head that as professionals, we hand young people on to other people as we go along that journey. And often that's not what young people want. And it's not about having that expert knowledge. It's about that consistency, the flexibility. It's about the, the kind of predictability of that support as well. And I, and I think that often for young people, that's the most important thing, mm -hmm. rather than having all the knowledge and skills but it's about making sure that that worker or that person, whoever they are, is supported and and actually has the access to all the all the information timidly, so that they can then relay that information not just to the child, but the people who are looking after the child and, and who who are actually supporting that young people out with the kind of nine to five yeah. set up as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think just a couple of issues. One in terms of courts and timing. Courts are very insensitive in terms of time. It's not something that the institution allows the sort of human impact to come in on. But we do see green shoots, in particular in family law, where we see the success of the PACE project in terms of permanency planning, which involves the court process as well, in terms of looking at all the causes of delay and how to reduce those. Mm -hmm. And we do that by bringing all the different agencies together in particular areas to look at what's causing delay. And perhaps an initiative that focuses on cases where children are giving evidence and brings together the court administration, police, social work, to look at um, you know, how do we reduce delay in these cases mm -hmm. may have an impact. In terms of the support provided to children, well, I don't know a lot about it. I do know that in England and Wales, they view the role of an intermediary as being very successful and appropriate. Um, somebody who is particularly, who knows, all, who knows the court system, knows the contacts, knows how to fix things, but also is good at relating to children and supporting the child and family in this process. And um, that isn't within the bill, and obviously is an extra person and an extra cost. But I just wonder how much we need to learn from the experience in England and Wales, where certainly they view that as being an important part. Thank you. And, and just finally, going back to that parent or carers uh, point that was raised in, in your submission, uh, Dodgy, would you uh, view perhaps an education programme to support parents and carers with understanding the court process? Um, would that be something that you'd be advocating for as well? Is that, do you think there's a lack of knowledge then to support young people more generally because their parents or carers can't explain the system to them and that you know, takes away perhaps from some support that could be provided? It's just about education. Sometimes parents and carers are actually excluded from the processes because mm -hmm. the, the services that are set up will work with the child, the young person. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think often it's about parents and carers not being aware of what... It's, it's not sometimes about the process and the procedures. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's about understanding the impact on the child and how they're going to manage some of those behaviours um, and getting, those, getting that additional support around the parent and carer and to build their resilience as well as the child's resilience mm -hmm. as well. So, yes, it's about education in terms of navigating that system, but it's also about, you know... I, I suppose parents and carers being fully informed and being properly prepared yeah. for the impact. OK, thank you. Uh, before we bring in Fulton, Malcolm, then victim support submission, and we'll be hearing from the next. They said they'd be quite interested to having discussions with the, the children's hearing system to see um, if they could play or get involved in the role, I suppose, of the intermediates or to discuss the role of the intermediates. And given you say there's a gap in the bill, would that be something you'd welcome? In, indeed, we've, we've created much closer relationships with Victim Support Scotland, who used to only um, support victim witnesses in um, criminal proceedings, but now supports children in, in our proceedings. Mm -hmm. And we found them extremely helpful in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, I can think of one case where the worker sort of identified it was a sexual abuse case, it was a girl giving evidence, and um, the court officer was a male. And yeah. 
they just asked, it was nothing to do with a particular individual, but they just asked if it could be a female instead to make the girl feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, that's just a tiny example of the sort of um, work that they can do because they know their way around. Okay. So, yes, they've got a lot to offer and it'll be interesting to hear their thoughts. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Fulton. Thanks, Kavita. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to stick on the, the pre recording of evidence and specifically joint <coughs> investigative interviews. Uh, carried out by the police and social worker. I, I should probably declare at this uh, point uh, uh, my registered of interest as a uh, registered social worker um, and I was previously involved in, in joint investigative interviews. So I, I think there's a general acceptance that, that they're not perfect by any means. And I just wanted to explore with the panel how you feel they could um, be improved um, probably around the, the period prior to the interview taking place and in the period after. And I think some of that's already been touched on, but Perhaps elaborate on that. We're, we're involved in uh, both the strategic and the implementation groups around the, the, the work around GIIs, which is focusing currently on improving the training for social workers and police officers. So I think that's really welcome, and we think that there is a, um, a need to make sure that the the GIII interview takes account of the broader needs of the child. Again, the danger is always that the child is subject to fitting into what the process is for the police and social work. So social workers are interested in care and protection, making sure that there's a safety plan for children. Police officers obviously have to be focused around the same thing, making sure that our children are safe, but also securing um, you know, enough evidence to, to, in terms of the, the accused. The danger in all of that is always that the child's needs get lost. So what we really want to do and what we're involved in um, supporting the process and is saying this training really needs to start with the ways in which children respond, the ways in which children experience um, abuse, neglect, you know, whether they're uh, victims or witnesses, they need to, we need to build a system that understands that professionals really need to start with an understanding of child development and communication. They need a broad training programme that focuses on children's holistic um, needs. So there is, there is real progress being made there, but we need to make sure that practically we have um, police officers and social workers who are able to build enough confidence, skill and knowledge to be able to do these interviews. They're incredibly tricky. Um, I, you know, I was uh, seconded into a, a, a multidisciplinary team years ago and delivered child protection training to groups of professionals. The challenge was always when they went back into practice, it might be six, eight months between interviews. And we know the evidence is that it takes somewhere around 100, 150 interviews before professionals get really confident and feel that they're really able to engage with children in a way that elicits their best evidence. So we need to think about the resource issue. We need to think about the support for practitioners. It's a highly skilled, challenging environment that we're expecting police officers and social workers to work in. And it's very difficult if in the morning you're at a children's hearing and in the afternoon you're rushing somewhere to interview a child. We can't we can't operate like that as humans. We need to make sure that this system isn't just about the GII training and we don't just focus on the interview. We need to get the whole system right and we need to have professionals who are specialists, who are skilled and who are able to give that child the best shot they possibly can to get so, their best so, evidence so given. So are you sort of suggesting there, because just now that would be mainly done through social work offices eh, and police offices are all specialised up and down the country. Um, are, you, are you suggesting here that it's, po it's possibly a specialised resource, that the workers would only be involved in that mm -hmm. particular line of work rather than We're, doing anything else? We strongly advocate, along with partners, and we know we welcome the government's commitment to work towards this, toward the Barna House model, the Child's House model, which takes children right out of the court system, develops a, a resource in a community that looks like an ordinary space for children, that has the child's rights and needs, not only for justice, but also for care and support built right into it. So the child and their family engage with one place. They go one place and the professionals come to them. Right now, the system involves children going one place to get interviewed, and sometimes two or three places to get interviewed, depending on how many times that happens, another place to get medical treatment or a medical examination if that's required, and then 
possibly, and, and uh, you know, most often, nowhere for any support to receive any long-term support to recover. So what we strongly advocate is that, that we really move at speed to deliver a child's house model that will elicit best justice for children and accused, but it will also save us all in the long term because you build in the support for the child to recover from the impact of trauma. So the child goes one place and the professionals come to them. So I suppose that, that links into the earlier part of my question because I'm, I'm interested um, to hear your thoughts on how we can develop relationships beforehand because many a time um, when I was involved in, in such interviews, I, it struck me as it would have been perhaps better if there was a, perhaps a non-interview setting prior to the actual meeting. Now, I know that's diff more difficult for the police and social work and understand the reasons for that, but I wonder, um, I wonder what your thoughts on that and would the model that you're talking about um, be uh, more, more open to that, if you like? I think it's such a complex area that what we... The first thing we should say is we would also advocate that we need to talk to children and young people because they have really strong views about this you know, this process. And, and often the, um, the answer, some of the most practical answers lie with children and young people because they would be able to, they, they do clearly articulate what would have helped. But we do think we're, there is a space that we need to create, a resource that we need to create for all of those complexities to be taken in account of, a place for exploratory interviews and discussions with children, for planning, for much better planning. We know that resources are so stretched, that the system is so pressed, that we cannot currently cope with the numbers of children that need this support. And so that what, what happens is it's, you know, we don't give children the best opportunities we can because we're, we're always having to you know, work at pace. And what we need to do for children is slow the process down so that it really matches where they're at and give them the opportunity so that there is a space, one space that's set up for people to have conversations, planning meetings, discussions about how you get the best evidence from, from children. But the most important thing is the current system and the, and, you know, the bill does, is, is progress, but we are still incrementally tinkering with a system that is not built around children's needs and never will be. And we really do need to think that that's why I think we urge the committee to think about this just as a start and not a finish, that this is better than we've currently got, but it is nowhere near good enough for children. We're still squeezing and squashing children into a system that is not built with their needs. And our view is that if you build a justice system that is right for children and for vulnerable witnesses, then it delivers better justice for everybody. We'll all do better if we build a justice system that has, is much more human and recognises the ways in which humans are impacted when they're involved in, in processes that require them to be you know, victims or witnesses. Can, just one more point, Kavina, is that right? Um, it, it was, it was to, uh, to Jit mainly, um, as well, in terms of one of the things you mentioned, um, the last thing you spoke was about it's not always the social worker or the police officer that would have the, um, the, the best relationship. Um, do you think that the, the model discussed there by, by Mary would, uh, you know, would allow for possibly a third person to be involved in such interviews, if, if, if necessary and required? I mean, I mean certainly um, we've been involved in four police operations in, in Glasgow over the last, uh, last seven years, and each operation has operated differently because what we've done is we've, we've kind of used the learning from each operation to try and improve our practice going forward. So in the police service a long time ago, they established something called solo officers, so sexual offences liaison officers. So as part of the operations, what, what would happen is each victim would be allocated a solo officer, and that person, in terms of their job, that's what they do. Do you know what I mean? That's solely what they do. And police officers are used to doing the whole statement um, given. When it comes to social workers, it, it's, it's been it's, a, it's an add-on. So it's, so it's as Mary described. You could be a children's here in the morning, or a core group, you know, at lunchtime, and then off you go to go and interview a young person. How well are you prepared? So, in terms of the police operations we've been involved in, we've had quite a lot of focus on planning meetings, um, and, and that's any that, and they and sometimes we can have two and three planning meetings before we go anywhere near a child, and that's about getting the people around the table who know the child best in terms of what's the best environment, what's the best time, what, what, what's the support that, that we need to put in place before the interview, after the interview. We've also had staff who've been that third person. Sometimes um, as a third person, we've sat outside the room. Sometimes we've actually been allowed to sit inside the room, you know, as an observer, as somebody who's a comfort, who knows, you know, 
what particular stress, um, what, what particular triggers um, might it, um, can result in that young person becoming stressed or animated or angry or whatever. So we, we, we've tried lots of different systems, but I think ultimately what you need is people who know the child and who know how to get the best out of the child being involved in that process. But you also need whoever's actually undertaking the interview, that being their sole task. Um, because if it's an add-on, then it's something that they're not particularly skilled at, confident about. And I suppose the question I would put to you, Fulton, is how many GIIs did you do in your social work career? And how confident did you feel going from one to the next, given the gap? Well, we're near 160 anyway. Mm -hmm. But do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so I think yeah. it's thinking about actually, if we are not in the best place, do you know, and feeling confident, then yeah. then how's that child? How are we supposed to get bring out the best from that child if we are not completely clear about what we're doing and how we're doing it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel, then Shona. Uh, so so I, I'm quite interested in, in looking at actually how the rules will will apply. I mean, I think that the, the panel has been uh, very good in terms of identifying kind of where we need to be and, and, and stating that, that, that this is limited. So can I begin by looking at the, the, the offences that this will apply to and the courts? Um, I mean, I note that the, the, there is essentially much of this will be brought forward by regulation. It's not all coming in at once. And given that, I was wondering if the panel thinks that it would be a sensible um, improvement to this bill to at least provide for the possibility of these measures being extended to other crimes and indeed to the sheriff court or indeed uh, other tribunal settings? Uh, I mean, is that something that you'd look to see at stage two? So I, I would particularly single out offences involving domestic abuse, where the child is at the centre of it. It strikes me those are the ones that put the most pressure on that child and are an obvious example of where you need to look to extend it to. I can understand the incremental approach, but the sooner it can be applied to cases which cause the most trauma to children, and these may be some of them, the better. I mean, are, are there any particular considerations you'd want to see looked at prior to the, the extension beyond the current scope? Um, or, or is it purely a sort of practical considerations once the practice is already established? Um, well, I've already flagged yeah. the core issue for me, which is its links with the child protection proceedings um, in that. Um, and I, I think the other practical issue which has an enormous impact on this is um, the ground rules hearing, yeah. which we haven't touched on. I'm, I'm about to come to that. <laughs> um, good, good, because I think you know we have experience of that in the hearing system. And certainly when that's applied properly, that helps make the setting, that helps yeah. create certainty, that helps create control in terms of, of the direction. Is there anything either Mary Glasgow or Daljeet would like to add? To the certainly point? agree in terms of children who are witnesses in domestic abuse situations, which is incredibly difficult for children, as you can imagine, to be in, involved as witnesses, and then also for children who are accused of crimes that we need to really think about their children too, first and foremost. Um, and if we are about seeking better justice for all, then we really need to, again, think about how these measures can apply to those young people so that their, their, be you know, their best evidence is also, also gotten and, and just some you know equal provision between high court and sheriff court because yeah. there is a gap yeah. i suppose the only thing that, that i would want to add to that is i mean i, I can I, I agree with what both Matt, malcolm and mary have already mentioned is is the whole issue that, that we refer to as harmful sexual behaviors and um, certainly what we are seeing is more and more young people that, that, that we would refer to in being involved in peer on peer abuse mm. um, and it can be harmful sexual behaviors it can be domestic abuse it can be child sexual exploitation and um, it comes in various guises but often what we find is that what, what happens is, is that we'll get a referral for the victim but will not get a referral for, for the accused who's also a child um, and, and and this can be children as young as nine and ten and eleven do you know what i mean and i suppose what i'm thinking is actually what, what we need to think about is for that accused to have been involved in that activity what's what what has that child been exposed to 
and, and we need to pay consideration to that as well. So I suppose I'm thinking about if we were to kind of open this out, is to look at how do we realistically support those children who may have, you know, been involved in the fences um, that are extremely harmful to other children, but also take cognizance of the potential in terms of what they've been exposed to themselves, either as witnesses, but also as victims themselves. Because often just now what we're doing is focusing on the victim, and that's in particular in relation to online um, offences um, in terms of sharing of images and also acting out some of those um, kind of activities as well. But we've had some recent examples where um, some of those offences that have been um, meted out by other young people haven't been seen, haven't even been seen as child protection issues, mm. never mind um, as criminal offences. And that's because the gender of the child has been um, looked at and considered rather than thinking about the actual offence and the, and the harm that's, that, that the victims may experience. So we need to think about peer-on-peer -peer, um, abuse as well. So, so, so Malcolm Shaffer just hit upon, I think, what I think was one of the central points, is that it strikes me that when you look at this bill, um, that the, it, it, it's highly dependent on, on the ground rules hearings working, that, that if you, if, essentially, the, the, the practice will flow from those establishing the right principles and and essentially the different parties are agreeing to a particular approach. D do you think that is the right way, i.e., you know, I think the argument that's made is that that allows it to be flexible and to develop, or do you think that there needs to, that the bill needs to go further in stipulating certain things that need to be considered or, or certain ways that either the ground rules proceedings um, either work or indeed uh, how they, how, what, what elements they should be looking at in terms of how the, the, the commissioned evidence uh, is actually taken? Um, I'm not sure. There's a limit to how much you can legislate for, isn't yeah, there? Indeed. And I think you have to... You've set up the provision. It is a provision which, we've, as I've said before, when we've seen it working, it works. It can really set the scene um, if the sheriff or commissioner, whoever's doing it, is in um, control of asking the right questions, ensuring it's there. Um, I'm not sure whether legislation can help develop that further or if it's more just um, using the, um, the experience and mm -hmm. understanding of, of the commissioner or whoever is doing it. I mean, one of my thoughts had been um, whether or not there should be just a requirement to consider particular elements so that rather than it, than it being explicit about precisely what has to happen, but mm -hmm. just simply saying that, that the ground rules here should uh, reflect on the support that might be required for yep. the child and familiarity with you know, context so that it, it, it doesn't need to legislate particularly, just simply asking certain things to be considered. Might that be a way of perhaps addressing some of the points that or can concerns that have been raised by the panel this morning? I, I think that issue about the support in particular would be very welcome. Yes, absolutely, because that would ensure that... I mean, hopefully they would be asking that question anyway, but I think having that in black and white, th that it's a check. Uh, are there any other...? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are the, the challenges I've already said is there are measures in the current situ system which are not always applied so we need to firm up the legislation to make sure that it's it's a default position that they, we anticipate that children will always require special measures and that those special measures are easily accessible available and that children have and young people have the choice um, of the, the measures that they want to be in to, to use so if I could just ask the panel one final question is I think one of the things that has been slightly surprising to me is that, in effect, what this um, uh, uh, you know, gives the possibility to is that you had a different individual who is the, the judge in the case from the individual who will be presiding over the ground rules hearing, who again could be a different person from the, the person who is actually the, the, the commissioner taking the evidence itself. I, I, I just wonder if, if that strikes the panel as odd and whether or not it would be better to have the same individual in all three of those contexts or whether that there's uh, the, 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 the sort of knock-on effects from doing that. I'm open to anyone answering that. I would agree that continuity of individual has a lot of advantages. The one danger is it could build in huge delay. 
Right. If that individual is already tied up with, say, a lengthy trial over the next two months or something like that, and certainly that's what we found by experience, that while there are huge benefits in having that continuity, um, the huge danger is that it builds in further, further delay. and thanks for your very interesting uh, evidence this morning. Uh, I'm going to come back to the child accused and resources, but first I just want to, I guess, ask about the tension that exists here, because throughout your evidence this morning, um, you've said a number of things, such as, you know, we need to work towards the child's house model, we need the whole system uh, approach and to get that right, we need to move at speed. But we've also heard you say um, what's already in the bill will be difficult to implement. And I think the tension is what should be about policy and strategy and direction and what should be on the face of this bill. And the two things I don't think are the same thing. And I think we need to be cautious that we get the basics right here. And given what you've said about resources, that we don't through unintended consequences, add more delay into the system. So I guess what I'm looking for is, first of all, I acknowledge that that tension exists, but where you think uh, we, we should get the right balance of what is on the face of the bill and what should be about a very clear policy intention. So and, and that's not an easy question, but I guess it's to reflect on some of the tensions within your own evidence this morning, which show the, how complicated this is. And I guess the Scottish Government have said in their evidence for that reason that it's about proceeding carefully because of such a major change. So where, where does that balance lie? It's a really difficult question. because <laughs> One we need to resolve, though. Yeah, yeah because I think, I think that's the difficulty for us. And, and, you know, I come here to represent the voices of the children that we support and their families and to represent their stories and to, to um, you know, to describe, to, to do justice to that, actually, mm -hmm. in the best way that I can. And it's, incre it's incredibly difficult because what we believe is that we don't have a justice system that is fit for purpose for children. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult and we would want us to see to see us implement an entirely different system. But we're also practical and we know that we're in, we are where we are with what we've got. And so we don't want to, as you say, rush into something and have potential unintended consequences because we work at speed and we don't take account of all the other complexities within the system. But we do think there are things that we could we could do. We could have, you know, and I, I think we've We've, we've agreed with this, you know, we could have a more holistic approach. We could have a system whereby um, we don't, you know, children go to one place and we could still do that within the system that we've got. Mm -hmm. Children could give, um, they could have their evidence pre-recorded, they could access support, they could get, you know, it's less about education for parents and more about support for parents to understand and navigate their way through what is a very complex system currently. So we do think we could make improvements to the current system whilst continuing to focus on this bigger prize, which is a much more child-centred, child rights-based justice system. The worry for us is that you you know there are welcome there are there are measures that are welcome within this bill. Of course there are. There's always been a challenge where even when there have been measures previously they're not implemented because the sus the system is not built around children. It's built around what the system needs and what the system thinks it, it requires from victims and witnesses. So you're right to point out the tension there is tension there. Um, but you know, it's our, we are obligated to the children that we support who continually tell us really painful, difficult stories about their experience of the justice system. And they are very clear about the things that they would want to see. Tell less people about some of the awful things that have happened to you. Mm -hmm. Get support much quicker to understand what's happened to you and to recover from them. To deal with few, a, a system that understands that you're a child and that delays impact on your ability to recall and to make sure that you are prepared and understand the process with which you're engaged. And there is a, there is a tension in the two things because we want to see progress, but the progress this, this doesn't go far enough. We know it doesn't, but we're starting in a really difficult place for children. So we need to you know, implement this bill, but not forget 
that this is a much, much longer term goal for children and we really do need to work towards something different. We do think we could immediately, so the, the child witness suites are welcome, mm. but they are far from Child's House and far from Barna House. We could have resources where we have all the professionals based in one place, where children go there and get all their needs met, the evidence is pre-recorded and that goes to court. There's nothing to stop us doing that. There's a challenge around resources, but our argument is the resources challenge, it costs us all anyway, because these kids and young people pop up in other parts of the system, which costs us. So we, we and I mean, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, and well, I apologise for that, because <laughs> you're right, it is a tension and one that we don't have the answer to. We welcome elements of the mm -hmm. bill, we'd like it to go forward there and we know that we are in the middle we, we, we are engaged in a process which isn't designed around children I mean it sounds to me what you're asking for is for a clear statement of intent of where the end point yeah. is yes. and this is part a of commitment. the jigsaw but it's a part of the jigsaw that needs to be got right um, resources sort of to interrupt you it was going to be a further question um, you've touched on resources already and maybe in answering it, the others could could touch on this Obviously, resources are not um, infinite. They're, therefore, in terms of the key priorities for resources, um, what would those be? You've just touched, Mary Glasgow, on the, the getting the facilities right and obviously the staff to therefore support the children. Is Within all of the resource implications and demands, is that what you would put as your number one priority? Yeah. Right, OK. I would absolutely agree. I think, you know, there's a lot that is not legislation dependent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can achieve by skilling ourselves better, by improving procedures within the law. Um, this, this legislation can act as a further boost and incentive to getting that right. Mary's already talked about the improvements that are already planned in terms of joint interviewing. I think that can make a significant difference. Okay. Um, so there's a lot that can be achieved. Um, and it's just always remembering we've got an ultimate goal and hopefully a timetable to get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just a matter of um, we've got this bill, we've ticked it, that's it done. This so you is would just like a stage. to perhaps see a timetable set out Absolutely. that wouldn't necessarily be on the face of the bill, but a timetable Absolutely. for... Okay. Um, I suppose for m myself, it's, bit, it's about giving children back a sense of control. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the, the, the children that we work with feel extremely disempowered and disengaged from the processes because they don't have an understanding of what's going on and why. And continually, what I hear from children and young people saying to us is, I just want this to stop. It's not that I want justice or I want this person charged and convicted. I just want this to stop. So it's about making sure that we listen to the voice of the child and, and not disempower them even more by going down a path that actually isn't in their best interests or isn't actually what they want. Okay. And just finally, you've, you've all touched on, I think, the, the issue of the child accused, um, which um, clearly is... Um, the bill at the moment does not extend the rule to the child accused and you've touched on the, some of the great areas of an accused child could also be a victim. Just in brief, I mean, do you think at this stage it should be included or is that something again that you would like to be part of a timetable going forward? What's your, your view? Going back to um, our original submission, you know, what, what, what we said was we understood why um, you know, you were taking the kind of pragmatic steps that you are in terms of kind of phasing, but I, I think ultimately it would be very helpful if we could also consider um, accused because I think um, there's children first and foremost and we actually don't know what's happened to them. Um, and I think it's really important that, 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 that we work with them as victims first and foremost and accused secondary. I mean, one of the issues put forward uh, against that argument was that it actually could do a disservice to the child accused in terms of their ability to then come back on evidence that has been heard in court. If you, That might be difficult if it's already evidence that's been given. So is that, do you recognise that as a, a tension? In yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. to say yes, it can be, but there would be provision, I think, uh, that could be and would be allowed that if there was any supplementary issues that that child could give further evidence. I think that's already built in okay. for the child witness, so right. okay. it could be covered. 
Okay. I think they're all, and they're all, I would agree, but they're, and they're already disadvantaged by the current system, and we would strongly um, advocate similarly to um, Daljeet that the ch children who are accused are most often children who have experienced trauma, have been victims of, of crime or abuse or neglect. In most cases, we have to consider that these children are involved in the justice system because of things that have happened to them that we may not know about. Mm. And they're already disadvantaged by um, the system that they're in. And I, uh, you know, I think there are measures that you could put in place to make sure that they do get an opportunity for supplementary mm. process and questions. Supplementary, Liam, briefly. Following off, I think a number of you have mentioned the, the um, child house model and, and, and ultimately that being where you think we should be aspiring to, to get to. Is there a risk in terms of um, uh, what we're putting in place now around this legislation, as, as Shona Robeson was saying, without um, a, a pathway to the, the, the ultimate objective that we end up using scarce resources to put in place a model that in due course we need to rip out in order to replace with something else? Is that a, is that a risk? It is potentially a risk, but I, I think there are we need to get to the child house measure model, but there are some challenges in getting there because it really does challenge the whole adversarial nature of our, of our process. So it's not just a, a resource issue, it's challenging some fairly basics in the legal system. So um, um, I, I'd love to get there tomorrow, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think realistically I can understand again the need for a staged approach in that. And is there any, any concerns you'd have that that um, that approach can be adopted given the, the resources required across the board, across the country, not simply in areas of highest demand? Mm. I, don't just a, I don't think it's just a resources issue. It's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. You know, because actually, if we really believed in getting the best, uh, you know, for children, we wouldn't be having this debate and discussion because it's about thinking about just now what, what we're doing is fitting children around an adult system that actually probably doesn't work for adults either. Do you know what I mean? And we need to think about what is it that children need and, and how do we get there? Um, and it is about having a timetabled approach. So, and I think that would be really helpful because obviously, you know, I can agree with Malcolm that, yeah, I'd like it tomorrow, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. But, you know, I suppose my, my kind of worry is what Mary said right at the beginning, which is we do this and we've ticked the box we tick the box and we think it's done. Whereas if we know that there's actually a vision to get to a better place and we know how we're going to get there incrementally, I think um, all the organisations around the table would be much more supportive of that. Because we know that we actually know what the end game is. Uh, the panel may be interested to know that the committee are actually going to see the, the Barnhouse model, so um, we're very interested, given your, your comments. Uh, John. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, panel, uh, I want, was going to ask your uh, position on the procedures for standard measures. I think the generality of that's been covered, and, and I know the simplified uh, notification procedure has been welcomed. Well, I particularly wonder if you wish to expand and indeed other panel members and, and a comment. You responded to that where you say that anecdotally witnesses' views are not always being sought at the moment and a screen and supporter are used as the default special measures and you very helpfully suggest a, 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 an amendment that would make, ensuring that reasonable steps were taken to ascertain the views of witnesses. Can the panel comment on that in the is there any further suggestions you would make in relation to that? Mary. Uh -huh. okay. earlier about the support, a support person that travels through the process with a child and young person and elicits their views and gives them information and is a flow between the, the system and the child and their family, that that would, that would be the, the process by which we could consult children on their views and make sure that any... Um, any choices that they make about measures are based on really understanding what that would look like and feel like. So, you know, children being able to physically see what it would look like to, to be given evidence in certain situations would be really, really helpful. There's a huge gap in that just now. In the hearing process, where we do consider special measures, we are under an obligation to consult with child and parents. So, that, you know, that is built in. Um, and you know, the effectiveness of that is partially dependent on their understanding of what those measures are, and that can take a, a bit of explanation. 
So certainly, yes, the, the intervention of, of that special person who's got that link, I think, will add to that process. Malcolm had, had already in a, in a previous um, answer um, made reference to intermediary, intermediaries um, that we have in England. I mean, so, I mean, so for instance, we've got services in England where they're called ISFA workers, so it's you know independent sexual violence advocates. That's their role. And what they would do is talk a, a child or a young person right the way through that process in terms of you know uh, um, you know about about who they need to talk to, what they need to talk to them about, and what the processes for that would be. But also continually be the person that then sh um, she information feeds back to the child and young person but also to the, the parent care and the wider network you know as appropriate in terms of what's happening next so, so that young person is kept informed all the way and, and isn't excluded from any decision making whatsoever um, and that's some, that seems to be a kind of system that, that works for children and young people. Um, it is introducing yet another person do you know what I mean and I think if we could introduce that person as early as possible in the journey um, would be helpful. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Communication is something that I've noticed coming up in all the submissions. Is there anything that hasn't been covered that you'd like to very briefly add on in terms of communication, whether that's you know, the child, taking the child's view into account? And I, th I think certainly for children, we've got experience of supporting children where they have communication issues or developmental delay or learning disabilities, where there is a requirement to have specialist support for um, the, the professionals who are involved in speaking with that child, interviewing that child, and make sure that those children's specific needs are taken account of, mm -hmm. um, and that there's careful planning about who might be the best person, what particular measures might be most useful for those young people. So just a real need to build an understanding that you know children's stages, developmental needs will vary across the piece, and we know that there is a huge gap around children with specific communication difficulties and learning disabilities. Yeah. And communication more generally, did you, did you, you've, you've emphasised I suppose that. the only thing that I would add to that is, uh, is that we've had very recent experience of working with a particular community where um, we simply in this country don't have interpreters who speak the same language. Um, so, and actually back home in their own countries, those people would be part of of part of somebody that, that, that they would describe as being their oppressors because of the language that they speak. So we have to be mindful not just of communication difficulties and cultural difficulties, but also that power dynamic. Because what you've got is people who don't speak the same language. Um, and also, interestingly, um, that particular community also don't have the actual vocabulary uh, in their language for words such, as, such like domestic abuse, sexual exploitation mental health, substance misuse, they physically don't have that vocabulary. And I've, I've, I've personally sat in some of those interpreting sessions where the actual interpreter said whatever they're saying and then had sexual exploitation. And, and you know the parent has had absolutely no understanding of what everyone's concerned about. So if we're going to properly communicate with children and young people, we, if we know right at the beginning that we don't have the words or the language, we need to find a different way of being able to communicate and make sure that people fully understand um, what's being communicated um, and can't be mis misrepresented in any uh, in any way at all. Okay, and Malcolm, anything to add? Um, it's there are delays that will still occur in the system, mm -hmm. and more than anything else, all of us need to be aware of just keeping somebody in touch as to what the delays are, why they're happening, what the timetable is. Um, it's a small issue, but it's the one that can cause most anxiety, mm -hmm. especially if something goes away and then quite suddenly, you know, you gave examples of, um, you know, suddenly nine months later hearing about a, a prosecution. Um, I think that's something that must cause huge dilemmas mm -hmm. for, for child witnesses in particular, Absolutely. and is one that we need to concentrate on, ourselves included. Thank you very much. That's been an excellent evidence session. Um, we will now suspend to allow it for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
I welcome our second panel, Ronnie Barnes, Trustee, Action on Elderly Abuse Scotland, Mary McGowan, Group Manager, Assist, Community Safety, Glasgow, Colin Mackay, Chief Executive, Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, and last but not least, Kevin Kane, Parliamentary Policy Research Officer, Victim Support Scotland. And as always, can I thank um, the witnesses for their written submissions, which do make a, a real big difference to the, the committee in advance of our, our taking evidence from you in person. Move straight to questions, starting with Rona. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning, panel. Um, yes, if I could just um, start on the, the submissions and, and maybe ask you to expand a wee bit on any concerns or anything that you, you've, you've highlighted in your submissions, um, albeit you, you do appear to be largely supportive of the bill. Can you maybe just expand a bit on what um, you feel could be added to the bill? Who'd, who'd like to start? Well, we, Mary, you're Mary. making. <laughs> I am. For me, I, I very much welcome the bill, um, but my, I have a real worry that it will be brought in for the most serious cases and then the progress will stop. And that has been our experience with the introduction of MAPA, for example. We were assured that when MAPA was introduced, that it would be introduced at first for real serious crimes and that eventually domestic abuse would be picked up. Um, under that process, and it never has been. Um, so my real concern is that without a timetable laid down, um, that um, Parliament can um, raise and, and you know, properly, um, that we'll lose any other benefits. So for me, a timetable for extension, I'm aware that the previous session witnesses raised that, so that for me is a, is a huge issue. Um, but so I'll, my big concern was about how it affected both adult and children's experiences of domestic abuse in the justice system. And I've brought some examples um, to, to let you, to talk you through that. But obviously, I'm happy to do that in a, mm, yeah. a process over the that, that's, session. That's fine. Anyone else? Echo that. We believe it's important that if you're witnesses are required to give evidence in criminal trials and we base that on our work with our witness service um, who prior to this submission have been very very helpful with me both staff and volunteers we've supported over 10,000 children in court and provided a supporter to witnesses in court over 4,000 times last year and as an organization we received over 22,000 via referrals many of whom were children and the most serious crimes involving violence and sexual crime. Now, during the process of, the, of, of, of these discussions, we've been told of the depth of trauma that our volunteers have experienced. One volunteer ex described feeling harrowed, and that's the volunteer, that's not the witness. So you can imagine the impact it would have on the witness themselves. So we support the bill and we support a timeline to broadening that to a range of victims as soon as practicably possible. Can I just ask you at this point, um, can I ask you what, at what point you actually get involved with, with, with the victim? You heard um, uh, Mary Glasgow talking about, uh, you know, step by step, same person all the way through, etc. So at what point are you involved? We are involved at every stage, stage of the process. Our victim service can be involved very early on. Our witness service um, with communication between the witness and the victim service are involved and also have to be reactive to on the day uh, caseload and they're based in courts all around the country. Mm -hmm. And we also provide support after, and that's really important as well. The organisations are trauma informed and seeking to make a lasting difference. So the answer is every step mm -hmm. of the way. And would that be the same person? If we can manage it, a single point of contact is what we try to achieve. And we are also supportive of the wider Scottish Government mission, which is to have a single point of contact to provide continuity, mm -hmm. minimise the trauma, minimise the contacts with multiple agencies and people. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that the sooner that uh, a particular child and a vulnerable witness uh, can, can have their evidence heard that their recall is better because it's exacerbated by the, the, the challenges that they've faced. Mm -hmm. and. It, more generally, if we can support someone start to finish, that's what we set out to do. 
Thank you. Mr McKay. Um, thank you very much. Um, we didn't actually put in our response to the bill, so uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll just kind of try and outline, I suppose, where, where the Commission fits in in this process. I mean, the Commission is a statutory body, and our role is to protect and promote the human rights of people with mental illnesses, learning disabilities, and uh, dementia. Um, and I, I guess we didn't put in a response because we, we felt the bill was primarily directed at child witnesses, which is the issue other people are better able to speak to. But we're very grateful for the opportunity to comment on this in relation to people with uh, mental illness, learning disability, and dementia. Because uh, I suppose the first thing to say is there is a problem, and there are, well, there are two problems. One is that there is reasonably good evidence that people with learning disabilities and mental illnesses are more likely than, than members of the general public to be victims of crime, and there are particular types of crime that they are especially vulnerable to and which can be very difficult to prosecute and can raise problematic issues in relation to the criminal justice system. Uh, so there's certainly a problem in terms of victimisation, and I think there is also a problem in terms of having equal access to the justice system. Uh, and we would see equality of access to the justice system as a, as a human rights issue. The Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which the Scottish Government has committed to implementing, puts a duty on states to take all appropriate measures to protect people with disabilities from exploitation, violence, and abuse, uh, and put in place effective legislation and policies to ensure that exploitation, violence, and abuse are identified, investigated, and, and prosecuted. So there is a need, um, both in terms of the the experience of people with mental illnesses and learning disabilities and in terms of the kind of broader context of, of equality to, to do something. In that context, I think this bill, um, you know, there's nothing we would object to in this bill. Uh, I think we would agree with others that um, um, if it's felt pragmatic to start with children, look at extending it later on, that's absolutely okay, provided there is um, uh, a proper uh, process and commitment to do that within a reasonable time frame. I mean, a lot of this work has been talked about for a number of years. The court services um, evidence and procedure review was back in 2015, so this this does take a while. Um, but, but in fact, in relation to people with mental disorders, there are probably some more specific things that need to be looked at, which I'm happy to talk about later on, particularly around how this links in with the appropriate adult system um, and perhaps the opportunity to develop the, the registered intermediary scheme, which I think you've already heard some, some mention of. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Mr Barnes. Yes, hello. Thanks very much for the opportunity to address your committee uh, on behalf of Action on Elder Abuse Scotland, a uh, campaigning charity to consider particularly the needs of older people. Um, I think uh, our submission highlighted the fact that our experience is that many older victims of crime are extremely reluctant to speak up due to the fear of consequences and the fear of going through the court process. I mean, why put yourself through uh, such a stressful pr process if you believe it's unlikely that there will be any prosecution? We're also aware that there's a very low level of uh, reporting of crimes against older people. Uh, furthermore, the ones that actually do end up in court our experience is that the prosecution, uh, the court system doesn't seem to take it seriously and that uh, perpetrators of abuse are treated on the lighter end of the sentencing scale. And this sends a signal, I think, that in fact these things are not taken seriously. Having heard some of the submissions uh, in the earlier uh, panel, particularly relating to children, I think you could read across that some of the measures that I think you would want to introduce for children as, witness, as vulnerable witnesses, you may want to think about the same sort of processes for older people who, again, would require special treatment, special measures to be able to give their evidence successfully and to be taken and nurtured through the court process in the way that isn't available to them at the moment. Um, Colin mentioned the appropriate adult scheme, and maybe there's something that could be expanded to include something similar for vulnerable older people, particularly older people with dementia. Thank okay, you. thank you. Jenny. Convener, um, I'd just like to ask a, a general question with regard to the benefits of pre-recording evidence to the panel, uh, for example, in terms of the impacts on vulnerable witnesses and, and the quality of evidence that that provides. 
Um, I should maybe just clarify, I never actually said in my nervousness um, what ASSIST did. Um, we're an advocacy project that works across um, the West Command of Police Scotland, um, apart from Dumfries and Galloway, so all of the West of Scotland, um, supporting victims of domestic abuse from the day after the incident right through to the end of the court process. We support adults and we support children um, and young people. We're co-located with the police um, as well in various um, um, various police stations. So we are very well aware of the issues that present. We talk to victims, again, adults and children, the day after the incident takes place. Um, and that's when you get fresh, you get good recall um, to expect traumatised people to remember what has happened over a long period of time just, just doesn't work. Um, and especially when it's um, a, a witness who's giving evidence against a family member, um, against their dad or against a partner, it's incredibly difficult if the, there's a sustained course of conduct, for example, over a number of years, um, and this incident that's going through court is perhaps a Section 38 threatening and abusive behaviour. And if the witness is thinking, now, what one was that? then it's very hard to get best evidence. So while there have been some um, advances made, um, some witnesses can see their statement beforehand. Um, but in terms of vulnerability, I think it's crucial for the administration of justice that statements are taken as quickly as possible and as near to the incident as possible. Thank you. The, the committee are probably already well aware of the Section 28 pilot in England. It will just take me 10 seconds to run through the report of that, um, which included pre-recording of evidence in chief and cross-examination and a robust ground rules hearing. The result of that was that it made it easier for vulnerable witnesses to recall events. They produced more reliable evidence which means it's fairer for everybody, including the, the accused. The questions themselves were more focused, more stream, streamlined, the scrutiny was better. The cross-examinations took place for a shorter period, the trial durations shorter in length, and there were fewer trials that, never, that, that were cracked during that process. Now, we should be looking to adopt best practices where we can, so I would urge the committee to look at that report. Bernardo's in their 2017 report also concluded that better supported and informed the witness and their well-being included and promoted and protected, the better the evidence will be. And that's in the interests of everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, in relation to somebody with, with a mental illness or a learning disability, in particular perhaps a learning disability of dementia, I think the, the same point about taking the evidence the earlier the possible in terms of recall, I mean, it's obviously much more likely that, that details will, will be forgotten if you have a person with dementia. And of course, obviously, if the person has dementia, it's a progressive illness, and, and so the person may actually be um, more ill by the time a trial comes along. Um, uh, and, and the other um, big advantage, I suppose, is just in, in terms of the level of stress and anxiety and trauma experience in giving evidence, that, that if that's done in a managed way, that will both reduce the harm to the person and improve the ability of the person to give evidence, because it's obviously easier to give evidence if you're not um, being traumatised by the process. Uh, I, I mean, the only caveat I would put is that, you know, a bad interview done early is no better than a bad interview done in, in, in the trial, and w which is why I think some of the issues about the kind of support and assessment of how a person should be interviewed if they have difficulties with communication, for example, is, is very important. It has to be um, tailored and individualised for the needs of the person. So it isn't just about pre-recording the interview, it's about how you prepare for that interview that, that is very important if you want to get the best evidence. Yes, I would probably echo those comments as well. Anything that assists older people to give their story and to be able to give the quality of evidence that's necessary to bring about prosecutions has to be welcomed. Can I add some of the examples um, that I was talking that I mentioned earlier? The what happens is that the the length of time really interferes. We had a, a 17 year old victim who submitted a soul and conscience letter, excusing her from court um, two months before the date of the trial, but she didn't know until the day before the trial whether she was going to give evidence or not. 
So by that time, she was physically ill with worry. She'd visited her GP, had become very withdrawn, and her sleeping and eating was not very helpful. Um, we supported a 13-year-old boy who gave evidence via CCTV on the day of the trial, but he was physically sick um, at court prior to being called to give evidence due to the extreme anxiety. And if that had been done earlier, um, permitted to give his evidence advance, there wouldn't have been that build-up um, uh, um, of trauma. Um, so there's something about giving evidence in early, but there's also something about keeping witnesses um, informed about what's happening through um, the, the process. Um, there, we're supporting a seven-year-old boy at the moment, um, and we are concerned about the level of stress and the, the, and the quality of the evidence that will be given. But we also know, as does everybody else, that if the case, um, if his evidence isn't heard, then the case will fall. So, the, you know, it's about trying the effort that our children and young people's ad, um, advocacy workers put in to try and prepare witnesses for the court beforehand. And as um, Kevin was saying about the debrief afterwards, so it's in, te in terms of resources, it's hugely resource intensive. Can I just ask a brief supplementary with regard to that point, Mary? Because I note in your evidence you say with the advent of the new domestic abuse bill, we'll expect more children will be cited to give evidence. So, in, in your expert opinion then, is the level of stress increased because of the length of time to get to court? Without a doubt. Children? Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, if you can put yourself in the mind of a child who knows that um, a parent usually dad is being prosecuted and they're going to have to speak up. Um, it would be far better um, if the evidence was taken at the time, because all the way through you also get people putting um, perpetrators, the perpetrator's family, putting pressure. Um, why are you giving evidence? Why couldn't you know, just withdraw your statement, etc.? So there's a lot of subtlety, a lot of subtle pressure that goes on outside of um, the court process, because after all, it's, it's, it's people's lives. So if we were, um, because of the, the new domestic abuse bill, a lot of the, the context Hopefully, a lot of the context around the individual Section 38 or the, the assaults that are led just now, the context will be picked up under the new um, legislation. Um, but and that that's fantastic, and we really welcome that. But unless we also look at the consequences of bringing in things like this, we need to make sure that we we move to a far better process for children as quickly as possible. Thank you. Um, and in terms of uh, taking evidence by Commissioner, I wonder if the panel might have any views with regard to whether or not that delivers the best quality of evidence currently. Who would like to start? <laughs> yep. um, had an increase in evidence on Commission. Um, we looked specifically at the Edinburgh High Court. Um, there, there, is, there is issues with facilities. Um, going to court, whether that's given evidence on the day or by commission, is still traumatic of itself. And there's issues of timing, uh, consistency, predictability on what room that will be. So we would support that in terms of the joint investigative interview that all of these things are, are mapped out in advance. Um, evidence on commissions been on the books since 2004, 2005, or thereabouts, and there's only been marginal increases, which takes us back to the point that some of the other panellists made about there being a timetable. We need to be pram pragmatic. However, we can't adopt a bill for bill's sake, and there needs to be ambition around the facilities that children give evidence. In the Scottish Government's submission to this committee last week, uh, they were candid about not knowing exactly how much resourcing that would entail, which I think is fair enough when we don't know what the take-up is going to be when the bill comes in. But in principle, we support evidence on commission with the best possible facilities, and if that can be done away from the court, the better. We supported Scottish courts, the recent money that they got to do that, which had hearing suite, um, uh, mirrors, special facilities, access to intermediaries. All these things need to be considered as part of the wider package. 
Yes, Colin. Um, yes, it's probably been a bit of a record, but, but as with the um, uh, pre-recorded evidence, I mean, it's, it's not just about giving evidence on commission, but it's, it's who the commissioner is, what knowledge they have, and what advice and support they have in relation to any particular communication needs the person has, any particular issues around how questions should be asked, because you know those are quite detailed uh, and specific things, which will be different for a person with autistic spectrum disorder as against a person with dementia, for example. So it, it need, if there is to be evidence given on commission, it needs to be on the basis of a very clear assessment of what the, the needs of the person giving evidence are so that that can be done in the best possible way. Um, model work for older people? I don't know. Would it? <laughs> So a lot of what I'm hearing from my colleagues, we're heading probably to children and mm -hmm. younger people, is, as I said earlier in my own opening submission, I think some of it you could read across to older people, certain vulnerable older people who would have the same issues of being able to tell their story in a way that children and vulnerable young people would have the same issues about. Okay. And Liam, just supplementary. One quick point and one substantive question. Just, uh, Mr Barnes, how do you define older people? I know in your submission you say t uh, you try to narrow it down, but whereas we can define children, for example, very precisely, what's an older person? Well, you could actually expand it to all adults at risk, um, which would be the three-point test in the adult support and protection legislation. But I suppose for us, we, we're particularly thinking about older people probably in their... 80s and 90s who are now living longer, living uh, in more cared for situations, but nevertheless vulnerable to some form of you know, exploitation and abuse simply because of their living circumstances. And people who are challenged by having some degree of uh, dementia, again, what we're seeing is the lifespan is for people is, in is increasing, but the risks are increasing exponentially with that. And it's finding a means by which people do not feel that they're going to live in circumstances where they can be exploited without the opportunities to be able to report that and having the comfort of a system that supports and understands them. Now, on that point, uh, so this is my substantive question, if I may, uh, we've, all the evidence that we've seen starts from the position that an appearance in court and the current processes don't elicit the best evidence and can re-traumatise, and Mr Kane talked about getting better evidence, better recall. Ms McGowan, you talked about not building up trauma, getting the evidence in early. All of those things could be applied much more widely than just vulnerable witnesses. Everyone could say the same thing, uh, with merit, I think. So why, if there are only positives to what's being proposed in terms of the process changes and no negatives to the accused, are none of you, particularly Mr Kane in victim support, why are none of you calling for the introduction of these changes across the entire spectrum, not just limited to vulnerable people? Or are there any negatives to the fairness of the trial to the accused? We are working within the confines of an adversarial system. Right. What this bill potentially does is open up the possibility of looking at the justice system as a whole and, and taking it towards a more inquisitorial system, and there are many systems around the world that do that. And that would be a child-based, rights-based approach, which would include the accused. It would include safeguards for anyone involved in the process. So we would be open to discussions on what a renewed compatible system with the bill would look like? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, similarly with something like mental disorder, I mean, you know, the definition in the Mental Health Act on, on some views could apply to one in four people at any point in, in their lives. Now, I, I think there's certainly an argument that says that, that there's a lot about the current court system which is there because of historical um, circumstances and doesn't necessarily um, provide the best evidence. But I think it's also fair to say that there are people who are further away from fairness than, than others. And I think it's probably reasonable to start with the people who have the worst time in the current system and think about how do you alleviate uh, the system for them. Um, and as that develops and as you understand how that can work. Um, to give you an example, I mean, so some of the work that's been done around cross-examining people and the kind of questions that you ask in a cross-examination, that started with looking at the person who may 
be a child witness or a, an adult with a, a learning disability, where you start to strip out, well, don't ask questions with double negatives in them, don't ask leading questions, don't ask, uh, you know, the particular styles of questions which, for a child or a vulnerable adult, are more likely to elicit an unhelpful and untrue answer. Um, and so you get better at that, but one of the things that has, I think, happened um, in the bar, with people who've been working that, I said, well, actually, this is how you interview. You should interview everybody. You shouldn't be engaging in a kind of you know mind game with somebody trying to trip them up. You should actually be asking them questions in a way which they're able to understand and respond to. So, I, I, I think it's right to start with the people who experience the worst um, defects of the current system and think about how you fix it for them. But I think it's absolutely right that over time that might extend to um, a much wider group of people. For all, nobody would disagree with that. But I think as a system as it stands at the moment, with its, as has already been said, adversarial nature of it, there are some who suffer more than others, and I would contest that older people particularly, but while vulnerable older people, are among those who are almost victims of the system rather than recipients of it. I think we also need to be realistic. Um, if we go into a discussion about how we would fix the justice system as a whole and pick up staff and look at the adversarial process and, and move to an inquisitorial process, for example, that's going to take an awful, awful long time. In the meantime, you've got vulnerable children, young people and vulnerable adults um, you know, who are suffering. And I don't think that we can leave that, which is why um, I'm in favour of having a staged approach. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to a situation where we can say we've got a perfect system um, and that it shouldn't be looked at, but we've got to be pragmatic and move um, you know, what we can, when we can, if, when we get consensus across society. And I think there is a consensus that um, children, young people, vulnerable witnesses, for me, that's vulnerable, you know, all victims of domestic abuse um, are deemed vulnerable under the Victims and Witnesses Act 2014. So that, for me, is an issue about let's pick up those we've already identified as vulnerable. Jenny. I'd just like to go back to my question on taking evidence by Commissioner and ask the panel what their views are uh, with regard to the importance of the ground rules hearing uh, in cases where evidence is to be taken on Commission. Um, Kevin? Well, it's important um, that the child's development needs and safety are met and it's easier to do that if you can get people to agree at a very early stage. There's a big picture vision for how that can be done in Children First highlighted, uh, they call it the Bairns House uh, model, where there are graphs on the wall in Norway. That's something you, you'll get a chance to look at, mm -hmm. um, which outlines based on the child's cognitive ability and any other complex needs that they may have exactly the tone and the type and the duration that that questioning should last. There are some good practice examples that we have of evidence on commission. Um, the best examples are where good relationships exist between Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Courts, Crown Procurator. That's where we can make contact directly, but we're navigating around a system with good people in our ranks rather than responding to a structural reality, and that's where we would like to be. the move to the Barna House model um, for that particular reason. Um, we don't have experience of giving evidence, you know, fighting for evidence to be given in commission mm -hmm. um, because most of the, you know, the folks that, um, that we support, um, it's mostly through the Sheriff Court. So that's why I'm, I'm not yeah. going to detail your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do think the ground, uh, ground rules kind of model is, is probably fundamental to preparing whether it's evidence on commission or, or, or at the trial and, and, and certainly the English system around registered intermediaries, that's very much tied into the idea of the ground rules process so that you have an expert assessment of the needs of the person giving evidence and what their deficits are and how those could be overcome and then you use the ground rules hearing to actually establish well this is how we're going to play this um, and if you have an intermediary this is when you can intervene this would be the basis on which you might be supporting the person so that we're all clear and you don't have the situation as it were when the evidence is being taken that somebody's suddenly saying well you can't do that that's unfair mm -hmm. so so I do think preparing and the ground rules hearing is is fundamental okay, thank you um, Fulton if you satisfied okay. Yep. Daniel um, I'd like to in some ways 
uh, take up where we've just left off there, um, both in terms of uh, the extension and also looking at, at how some of the rules will be enacted, and particularly the ground rules hearings. But just beginning by the scope of what this uh, uh, takes in, and, uh, and particularly based on what you just said, uh, Mary McGowan, about you probably being primarily concerned with the Sheriff Court, and this obviously only pertains to solemn procedure and the High Court and specific offences. Given that Section 3 already, essentially just by simple uh, uh, ministerial regulation, extends this to other vulnerable witnesses, do you think that you would support a move to put similar provisions to extend this to other types of court hearing, obviously based on how uh, it, it embeds in practice um, with, with, with the you know, child witnesses and so on? Is that something that you would support? Absolutely. Um, we do support um, victims through um, petition. Um, a lot of the, the incidences of domestic abuse don't go through the Sheriff Court, but the vast majority of them do. Um, but for me, if we look at the experience of the witness, then we, we, we need to put the, the, create a, a process, whether it's in the High Court, um, a Sheriff and Jury, or whether it's a Sheriff Court, where we are looking at um, how does the system ensure that best evidence is given? And the only way we will do that is by extending the, um, the process as laid out um, here. So I support wholeheartedly the, um, the fact that you're starting with the High Court. It makes absolute sense. Of course it does. Um, but we need to make sure that um, it's, it doesn't stay there. Um, because the evidence that we have from service users, from children, from young people... Um, and, and the trauma that they're experiencing, you know, is, is as great for them in the sheriff court as it would be in a sheriff and jury or in the high court. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that the, the entire panel has supported the, the extension of this principle and practice to, to other areas. Mm -hmm. There would obviously be practical considerations for doing that, given the volumes. Are there any other things that, that the panel would think would need to be considered or reviewed prior to extending this to other categories of both witness case and, and court? at the support for children. Um, the Daljeet mentioned earlier on about um, the ISVA model. Um, our children and young persons advocacy worker is that, that, in fact, the whole of ASSIST was based on the IDVA model, which was the domestic violence advocate down south, and that's exactly what we do here. So we've taken a lot of that um, and used it for over 15 years, passing information back and forth between ourselves and the Crown um, and the witness, and acting as an intermediary. And... Um, out of court, of course. But the issue for me is that we've got systems like that that we could build on. Um, and having a, some kind of support worker who was skilled and experienced, and um, that there was a set of standards that made sure um, that everyone adhered to, um, I think would be very helpful. But we, I don't think it's enough just to, um, you know, we, we need to look at the wider process and a support worker, I think, would be helpful. Kevin Kane, you were nodding your head. Yeah, um, the role of the com commissioner is, is, I think, still to be explored and who that person will be. We would support uh, the commissioner um, being the ultimate arbiter on what questions to give. But it ties to just a point that, that Mary made there uh, about training. Training doesn't end when you become a solicitor. Uh, the Law Society of Scotland, by the way, excellent response to this, so I'm not having a go. They seem very supported, provided that there's remuneration and resourcing. But we need to upskill the commissioners. They need to be trauma aware. And there's already, uh, act, there's already the National Trauma Training Network and other uh, useful tacts that we could take to ensure that they understand the ramifications of certain tones of questioning. We know that solicitors from the evidence out there and 30 years' worth of empirical evidence all over the UK that routinely do not adjust their questioning. So training is of paramount importance for everyone involved to get to get what we're trying to achieve in the bill, right? So, so you, 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 can I just interpret what you're saying? Yeah, saying yeah, that, you should, exactly. that there should be explicit training... Yes and a review of practice for, for commissioners in these circumstances, and that, that should be put in the face of the bill? Is that what you're suggesting? There should be a judicially robust function, and if that means explicitly outlining that in the bill, then so be it. But that would be some work with our partners uh, to ensure that that was deliverable before we put yeah. 
inked paper. Um, and just on that note, I mean, and again, following on from my question that I asked the previous panel, the, 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 the considerations that are required on the Grand Rules hearing are, are, are relatively narrow about the, the form of, of questioning um, with the, the possibility of extending support where that's necessary. I was wondering if, if the panel thought that the, there were other considerations that should be made explicit. And indeed, uh, 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 one of my reflections this morning is whether or not that, that possibility of further support should be a much more positive duty to examine what supports can be extended to, to, to the individual. I was just wondering if there was any thoughts on those suggestions. I get my colleague who's, who's an expert in that field, but just to say there should be consistency with other progress in the justice sphere and the autism justice strategy is just one item that's sort of bobbing along there. So we need to get consistency across the board so we can tackle complex needs in a very drilled down focused way. Um, yes, I, th I think if you're talking particularly about um, adults with um, uh, vulnerability through mental illness or learning disability, the, the comments you heard at the earlier session around consistent support throughout the system um, for children would, would equally apply. And that's also the, um, the, the conclusion of work that's been done where people with learning disabilities um, are accused of crime. So there's work done by the organisation called SOLD. And that's the kind of key demand, really, is saying that, that you have to have somebody who helps the person understand what's going on at different stages in the system. And the difficulty up to now has been we tend to take one bit of the system and say, what can we do to get this person out of this bit of the system and onto the next bit of the system? And, and the appropriate adult scheme is, is a very good example of that. I mean, the, as you know, Parliament's legislated to put the appropriate adult scheme on a statutory footing, and, and the government's about to implement that, but, but the appropriate adult scheme is a police scheme. It's there to help the police get an interview, and then once the police have got their interview, that person goes away, doesn't normally participate in the court process. Um, and so what the person, whether they're a witness or a victim or uh, indeed an accused person, needs is somebody who can take them through this, the system. And there, that really isn't a role for anybody at the minute. I, I, I think even if the ground rules hearing or a judge were to say, can somebody do this? There wouldn't be anybody stepping forward to do that. So I do think that is something which does need urgently to be addressed. Okay. And Mackay, can I just ask one final question? I mean, do you think an, an explicit assessment should be made at the ground rules hearing of, of the deficits or, or requirements of the individual giving evidence? Because that's not actually, I don't think, explicitly stated. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a much broader assessment that's... that's required. I, I, I think if somebody's communication is impaired by... Um, you know, mental disorder of whatever kind then, or ability to kind of engage in the process is impaired, then I think that does need to be explicitly addressed because, uh, I, I, as I said, people have huge differences in, in what their vulnerabilities are or what their deficits are. And of course, some people uh, will be well able to give evidence notwithstanding that they may have a mental illness, for example, but other people may have quite complex um, or possibly even hard to notice deficits. One of the issues for people with dementia, and Ronnie can probably talk about this often, is that they may actually present as being more competent and capable than they actually are. So there may, there may be an assumption, well, this person can come and give their evidence, when in fact uh, they may have difficulties with some aspects of giving their evidence. And at the other extreme, people may appear to be unable to give a coherent account to themselves, but if properly supported, could give uh, a coherent account to themselves. And I think there's, there's a very important point here, which is, it's not just about the trauma of people giving evidence in court. It's about the fact that unless people are supported, some of these cases will never get to court. I mean, the historical evidence around, for example, sexual abuse of people with learning disabilities, there's often these cases never came to court because essentially the system decided, well, this is never going to, we're never going to secure a conviction here because of the person's inability to give evidence. So why put the person through that trauma? So unless we actually... Um, do that more kind of thorough and detailed assessment, it's unlikely these cases will go through the system properly. Shona? Oh, sorry, um, you had the finish on. Sorry? Yeah, sorry, I hadn't realised you. you oh, just, to just, to, just to kind of confirm what Colin was saying in relation to older people, I think there are certain categories of vulnerability in terms of physical frailty and also in terms of mental impairment, particularly dementia, which I think would be recognised at an early stage within the you know, the, the complete uh, making process that a person is not able 
without some degree of support to be able to sort of give their evidence appropriately. And I think anything that within the model that you're talking about in relation to children and other vulnerable adults, I think also should be applied to certain categories of older people as well. And I would like to see that as part of your consideration in this bill. And Marie, did you have anything to add? Well, just I think there's a lot that we could do um, in terms of um, providing support for court. The work that we do, um, for example, is not available across all of Scotland. Um, so children don't have the support um, even that you know the, the, sm the small group that we've got in the West can do. And I think it's really important that the Scottish Government uh, and look to ensuring that there's uh, an equality um, because people in Stornoway and whatever just need as much support as, as someone in the centre of government. Thank you. Shona. I want to just um, explore, as I did with the previous panel, a little bit about the tension of what's on the face of the bill and what's about clearly setting out policy and strategic intent. And I think that's quite important. Previous panel, uh, it was by one of the panellists said that they, they would be concerned about unintended consequences. So, for example, further delay potentially because of uh, maybe a mismatch of pace of what's becomes law and what can actually be done on the ground. So I guess what I'm looking for from the panel is just where you think that balance lies around what should be on the face of the bill in order to make progress incrementally, as I think everybody's accepted needs to be done, and what could better lie elsewhere, whether it's in a timetable, for example, or clarity around policy intention and strategy. Uh, so where where do you lie in terms of that that um, that tension in terms of what, what should be on the face of the bill and what should be elsewhere? Yeah, I think if you start um, with the High Court cases that you've talked about um, and that you have an absolute timetable set down so that everyone else um, is aware um, of when the, the you know they can be brought into this. I think that would go a long way to um, alleviating um, issues. I think that um, I don't think we could ever be in a situation where we could say that the you know the the timetables won't slip. But we do need to be aware of the impact of delays. Um, there's uh, we're supporting a 19 year old victim at the moment. The substantive issue happened three years ago. And the, the, the trial has been adjourned seven times. Now, nobody is, is doing that deliberately. Nobody, the system isn't trying to upset that young person. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that young person has been waiting three years. So the, the, there needs to be some way, I think, of whilst we have, for example, um, you know, all domestic abuse trials should be done within 10 weeks, there needs to be some kind of the only word that's coming to my head is backstop, which is no the right word in a day like today. <laughs> However, um, there needs to be something at the back of it that will allow um, issues to be picked up mm. so that we're not just looking at what's in front of us, we're looking at where the unintended consequences, where would, the, 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 where would the, the system pick up things that are falling through? The, because what happens is we tend to focus on what's um, in front of us, not who's fallen through or, or what's fallen over the edge. OK. Um, I, I mean, I, the others might want to come in, but maybe just while we're on the subject, I guess, of resources, which is part of this as well and the fact that they're not infinite what would be your key priority for investing in terms of what you've just said about what the day-to-day -day experience so where do we where do we focus the resources in addition to um the the, the timetable of what needs to happen when what's happening specifically with this bill in terms of where you think the biggest difference could be made in terms of, of resources, what, what would that be? OK. And That's a timetable set out to... Uh -huh. OK. Is there anybody else? There needs to be uh, checks and balances written in where perhaps uh, government and, and our statutory body partners have an obligation uh, to review the progress mm -hmm. quickly after the bill comes in. In children's first submission, they refer to the European Promise Exchange, um, which is a starting point for developing a, 
framework for monitoring progress, and that might be something that's worth that's worth looking at. And I think money should be spent there to ensure that that we get it right. And if we're not getting it right, it gives us a chance to revisit it quickly, and then less vulnerable witnesses will be put in any sort of predicament. Um, yeah, I mean, this this may just be me speaking as a former civil servant, but I think I'm, you know. I am a bit thoughtful about not putting too much detail in, in primary legislation sometimes because, as you say, sometimes it turns out that it didn't work out quite how you wanted to and, and it's then very difficult to change. So I think it's important that the legislation does set out the kind of broad parameters and a framework within which progress can be made. I think it's equally important that you have uh, a kind of political commitment and a process of, of monitoring progress. I mean, one of the things I would commend the, the justice system for. I mean, I think the work that was done, for example, around the evidence and procedure review and the general progress around joint working around a lot of reforms to the justice system over the past five years has been quite significant and, it, and is not the way that the justice system used to work in the past. I mean, the, the justice system used to think it was almost constitutionally inappropriate that the police should talk to judges or that judges should talk to government. And the fact that something like the evidence and procedure review has got as far as it has, I think, is to be commended. I think there's a danger, though, that once you get into the difficulties of implementation, you're right, some of that energy and commitment gets lost because, you know, it, you, you get into the, well, let's just get this one thing done and then we'll see where we are kind of mentality. So I, th I think it's important that the, um, that the committee and the parliament, I suppose, does continue to hold the government to account for um, a clear framework for action. Um, I, I'd also think about, as I say, some of these international uh, obligations, such as the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and such as the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, because they have monitoring mechanisms as well. And I think sometimes the government needs to be um, held to account through those monitoring mechanisms, particularly for how the justice system has um, served the needs of, of children and people with disabilities. So I think there are different ways of doing this, but I think it's important that collectively this adds up to uh, a framework for action. Okay. Um, I don't echo what's said. I'm not so familiar with uh, what, what may be well be in the bill, but uh, anything that sort of ensures that things are moved as progressively and as swiftly as possible is to be welcomed. Just finally, um, we've touched on this already, but just to make sure we've got um, your, your full views on the, the record of whether adult witnesses who may be vulnerable on other grounds but are not deemed to be vulnerable witnesses should be covered uh, by the new rule, and if not, um, what should be done to ensure taking evidence by a commission is used where appropriate. Now, you've already touched on that to some extent, but is there anything else you would want to put on the record in terms of that? question. Following up what you said there about UNCRC, because that also does explicitly state mm. um, that where possible governments uh, should uh, seek the views of, of children and not put them in any mm. traumatic position. This bill would give effect to UNCRC, so that's just a broad point mm. worth getting on record. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I, I think just picking up the, the point Ronnie made earlier around other definitions of vulnerability around things like adult support and protection legislation, which I think may be slightly broader than the definition of vulnerable witnesses. Sorry, I haven't done a detailed check, but may, maybe slightly broader. And it, maybe there needs to be a process where people who, as it were, don't quite fit one of the categories, but can identify why they would need additional support or additional measures, can, can ask for those uh, measures and, and allow that rather than just so say, out well, with the legislation, you mean, as a... Well, I suppose the legislation could allow a kind of as it were, an additional could process enable. by which people could demonstrate why they would need extra support mm -hmm. if they're not in one of the existing categories. Okay. I think the adult support and protection legislation does give you that useful three-point mm -hmm. uh, three sort of issue in, in relation to an adult at risk and using that as a definition as a starting point. Okay. However, that three-point test really is very, very few people 
satisfy that three-point test. And we see that's why um, I was talking about vulnerable witnesses in relation to the v Victims and Witnesses Act, because it's far wider mm -hmm. um, and there's particular categories there. Um, my worry about the, the three-point test is that it's so difficult. Um, there's so few people picked up. So it would really be important to identify what the definition would be yeah. and why. Definitely. OK, thank you. There seems to be consensus in the support for the Ban House um, approach for child witnesses. I wonder if you have a view if some form of Ban House approach could be adapted for vulnerable adults. I think it could be. Um, I guess it, was, it would be on my wish list. Um, I, the, I suppose, again, it's, a, it, it's my pragmatic approach that there's... I would like all adult victims of domestic abuse, um, and I can see how it can fit other adults as well to go through some kind of model like that. Um, but being pragmatic, I know that um, if it's going to take some time before we get it in place for children, as Malcolm said earlier on, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done. Um, but there's absolutely nothing to stop that model being used um, as a way to ensure that um, best evidence is got from children and from adults. OK. Any other views? Yes, Colin. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that I've... I know enough about, to be honest, the, the Barnes model to say that it could, could readily be adapted to vulnerable adults. So I guess I would say um, I wouldn't be against it in principle, but I suppose there's a note of caution around, as we're taking something that works for one group of people, for children, and saying, well, just do that for, for adults as well, because they have a, a learning disability, for example. I think you do need to be mindful of the different kind of needs that they may have. Uh, and, and the other thing in terms of what you might do quickly is in relation to the registered intermediary scheme, it just feels like that's something which is kind of on the shelf. Uh, the, the English have had that scheme since 2004. Uh, it's been copied in Northern Ireland. It's been copied in South Africa. It's been copied in parts of Australia. So I think in relation to, to vulnerable adults, there are already um, schemes that would potentially make quite a significant difference, which I think could be um, possibly adapted more quickly than the, the Barnhouse model. I say that's not to say that you shouldn't do the Barnes model, but I think there may be other things as well. Okay. Kevin? Yeah. A mapping exercise of just where the facilities are in Scotland at the minute to elicit the best evidence uh, might be something that's useful. There's some good signs out there from the Justice Centre that's got spades in the ground in Inverness. You've got the advancing facility at Atlantic Quay, the money given to Scottish courts recently, but I'm not sure there's an accurate picture at the minute of where the best evidence on commission sessions are, are happening, where are the best facilities, have those facilities been born out of what child and other vulnerable witnesses have said, that would be something that maybe could run alongside the bill. And we also accept, uh, as a large victim and witness organisation, uh, our role in that, and we'll help, if we can, to map out our experiences and see if that ties in with the government build team, our statutory body partners and our third sector agency partners, because at that point you might be able to identify and drill down in the gaps in the system. Um, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I noticed that you had mentioned about uh, maybe working on talking to the uh, children's hearing, you know, in terms of the intermediate, which you just touched on for, for the children, and they were quite positive in the response in yes. the last session. Yes, 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 that's ongoing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Mary. not familiar with this particular model, but accepting Colin's caution about it, maybe it doesn't read across to all sort of vulnerable adults, I think there may well be merits from what I've heard about it to suggest it could be applicable to all vulnerable little people as well. Okay, thank you. John. Thank you. Um, panel, you, you, you've touched on this um, in general terms, but specifically about the procedures for standard measures and the simplified notification procedure. Um, I wonder, could you, you comment on, on your views on that um, and believe, see whether you feel there's a need for further reform? We heard on the last panel, uh, perhaps you weren't all there, that the children's hearing suggested that a, a specific amendment to guarantee consulting witnesses, the suggestion being that measures are sometimes put in place in the form of a companion or a screening without actually consulting the individuals? I think it's really important to consult witnesses beforehand, um, but I would add the caveat that I put in my um, evidence, whereby we find that a lot of um, 
Victims of domestic abuse will start by saying, I am going to face them in court, I am going to stand, and, and as the court date gets closer, um, that becomes um, just too much. Um, and the, this is where the trauma-informed approach can be really, would be really helpful, um, because sometimes when we say at the last minute and we ask VF to, uh, or the court to um, ensure that there's, there's screens, then it's seen the trying to get screens at the last minute is always seen as a bit of an issue. Um, so, um, if there were some kind of standard measures, it would make it a lot easier for that category. But if we could consult with victims beforehand, because some people do find that screens are, uh, can be great, but it's, it, it's, the issue is that not everyone, when they apply for screens, understands that the accused can see them. It's only the witness that can't see the accused. And some people, when they find that out, say, well, you know, I'd rather just, um, you know, have a, an ordinary courtroom. So I think we do need to be flexible um, and uh, bearing in mind, again, the argument about resources and the level of amount of cases that are going through the system. Um, but I think that we could, you know, if we could combine standard notification, you know, just standard special measures being available, but also consulting with the witness beforehand, I think it would be helpful. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do think the worst thing you can do is say, well, you've got a particular label, so you'll be getting one of yeah. these, um, and that may not be what, what, what you want or need. Um, although I think the second worst thing you can do is probably say, expect the person to understand immediately what it is that might help them or might not help them. It, it often makes me think about the way that doctors kind of get consent for operations now, and they've all been told, oh, you need to get the patient's view. So they then explain this very complicated procedure and say, what do you want to do? And you think, well, I don't know, you're the doctor, you tell me. So I think there is something about giving the person the time and the space and the support to understand what it is that might actually help them, why they might want it, and, and, and to make choices. And, and as Mary said, to change their mind. If, if, if actually nearer the time they feel, well, I thought I could do this, but, but now I feel I can't. So, so absolutely, you shouldn't just impose things on people because they fit a category, but you also need to support them so that the choices they make are actually genuine and informed choices. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> and just finally, um, communications being touched on, uh, anything you would like to, to really say um, over and above what you've said you know, about special needs, but also communication generally, um, which can be so important in the whole process. Kevin, perhaps? The, the example I gave earlier about the joint investigative interviews, um, the potential for that to drive up the collaboration between victim agencies and the statutory bodies is huge. And I base that on what witnesses, what our witness service has told us about the best application of the of current special measures and evidence on commission and time and time again it's where there are good relationships so if we can get to a situation where we're all the various people with different interests around the table early yeah. then i think the positive domino effect of that will be that we will communicate quicker we'll communicate more effectively and we'll see one another as allies in the system so it's a holistic approach mm -hmm. yeah okay any other comments Colin? um just really a brief comment about uh, our data. I mean, I absolutely get the point that's been made a few times about um, prioritisation and limited resources and, you know, how big a problem is this. And I think one of the difficulties, particularly for adults, is we perhaps don't have very good evidence around the extent of, um, you know, the prevalence of crimes committed against people with learning disabilities, for example. That was a recommendation we made uh, in a report called Justice Denied about 10 years ago. And an awful lot has changed since then. There have been some tremendous improvements since then. But, uh, but I still think sometimes uh, we, we, we do lack, and it might be something the Crown Office might be able to help with, um, much evidence about um, the nature and type of crimes and the, the, the extent of vulnerability and, and victimisation of vulnerable groups. Okay. Murray? Nothing to add. Nothing. And Ronnie? I just hope that uh, in the course of the progress of this bill that we do actually see a mention made of older people and their particular issues in relation to being able to both being victims of crime and how they're treated and also their ability to give their evidence and their story in the way that is appropriate to them. Okay. That concludes our questioning. I thank you all very much for attending and for um, that very worthwhile session. Um, 
we'll, I think, well, we're now actually moving to formal, um, uh, into, uh, we, that concludes our, our, our Justice Committee 31st meeting of 2018. I'm so unusual for us just to have two panels and to be able to say that concludes our meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on Tuesday 4th of December when we'll continue our evidence session on the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill.